welcome Andy. Hello, um, thanks for thank joining you. us. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Lovely to see you. So I do have some questions, but actually what I'd like to do for this session is does anyone have anything specific that they wanted to ask Andy about on this particular session that we can deal with? We'll do the questions first. I just have a general comment on this. I think um, side effects are really um, underplayed by the oncologists. Um, quite often I go in and my knees and my joints are really bad now. Like they've just, just the obvious, I can hardly move. And I'll go, oh, I've got sore knees. And they'll be like, um, oh, side effect. And that's all I get. I don't get any more. Mm -hmm. So I'm all off on my own doing that. And mm -hmm. also I've said to you before, Andy, sometimes when they say they're side effects, yeah. I've, I've imagined that that's just what you're meant to expect and then not reported them. And then they've said, yeah. why didn't you let us know? And I was like, because exactly. you told me this was going to happen. So it's yeah. not just that balance. Pam, you make such an important point. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, still an ongoing point you know I worked as an oncology nurse in the hospital 20 plus years ago and I've been at Maggie's for 20 years and I know that in clinics when I sat in clinics previously people like yourself would report a range of symptoms and in some respects with all due respect to the oncologist what they were concerned with is this is this an immediate life-threatening symptom or not is this immediate life-threatening side effect or not and they have a an internal algorithm of risk and they tend to focus on the things that are clinically medically very pressing and sadly sore joints ranks very low on their clinical ranking of um, symptom but for you sore joints affects you all day every day as soon as you wake up trying to do yeah. normal simple basic mm -hmm. so in some respects for you it's your top ranking symptom because it's impacting on normal quality of life issues and it, it's so disappointing to hear your report that still 20 years on that is the case mm -hmm. To your second point, you're absolutely right. Um, with that, one of the challenges that, that I experience sitting with people is that most people don't want to report all of their symptoms because they don't want to be seen to be ungrateful. They don't want to seem to be complaining. They don't want to seem to be intolerant of. They don't want, also, they don't want their treatment to change. You know, I'm, I'm telling you all of these side effects because I want a change in my side effects, but I don't want to change my treatment because actually I'm, uh, the, the, my disease is being well controlled. So in some respects, there is a risk in reporting your symptomatology because, oh my gosh, does that then mean that my consultant doesn't think I can cope or I'm not doing well enough or they're going to change it? So it's a dilemma. I, I guess what we would always encourage you to do is to say, I'm delighted that my hormone therapy is managing my disease as well as it is, but let me tell you what I'm struggling with on a daily basis and, and say it frank. So this is a day report. In the morning when I wake up, it takes me 15 minutes for me to unratchet my joints to be able to stand up out of bed. In the morning, it's, after I've had a shower, I have to lie down again because my fatigue is so complex. You know, whatever it might be that's there for you, name it in a factual way. Because the, the medical team and the nursing team appropriately want to hear those facts and importantly, they can't refute those facts. If you present those, um, those symptoms in an emotionally... Uh, elaborate way then they're more likely to be dismissed again with all due respect to the clinicians and also yourself sometimes it's very difficult to report those symptoms without emotion being part of it because it's three months since you saw them and you're really frustrated that you've been dealing with joint pain all that time so as you speak out you might get tearful and that that's entirely appropriate it's absolutely fine to be tearful but the risk is it stops you being listened to because you're being hysterical or you're just not coping or today's just a bad day and or it's because you're stressed about coming to clinic mm -hmm. so it's often a very useful thing to do to make that list and even just shove the list across the desk absolutely mm -hmm. and, and to try and report it as factually as possible so on a daily basis this symptom i would grade as a nine out of ten and this is how frequently it happens on a daily or a weekly basis and this is the impact that it has on my abilities or my quality of life or my capacity to work or because I guess your, your question, um, Pam, sadly, is a very good starting point for this conversation, is first of all, how do you report symptoms and side effects and make sure you're heard? And how do you report symptoms and side effects without the fear of being dismissed or not listened to? Yeah. Sadly, there's, I see you're nodding, Nicola, lots. Is that, has that been your experience? I think that's probably the same for, for most of us on this call, actually. So. Mm -hmm. We hear about like fatigue diaries and gut diaries. So do you think like a side effect diary is something that's just as important? Categorically. Can I just um, be lifting everything that you're feeling? Yeah. The, the downside of that is it's kind of like filling out a 
personal independence claim form you're you're reporting the complexity of how rubbish things are and that, that's really difficult psychologically it's really hard to reinforce to yourself just how shit life is sometimes yeah but in terms of getting a clinical response you're much better off making that list um and, and try it might be that you just do it two days before you go to clinic okay now i'm going to reflect on the last week or the last month and i'm going to write it down so that it it First of all, you recall it when you walk in to a stressful consultation and also importantly that you've you've got um, evidence. So your sheet of paper or your um, screen on your phone is your evidence. Um, the other thing that isn't a bad idea, and it partly depends on your relationship with your oncologist um, or your surgeon, is to email them a few days before you're due to be at clinic. So these are the things I would like to discuss at clinic. So you've taken all of the emotion out of it. Um, you, you're not having to share yeah. with your consultant to you might really respect but it always feels a bit scary so you've given them the heads up they've had a bit of chance to think about it and uh, they might have had just they might have a solution for you before you even walk into the room mm -hmm. there are some really useful apps so um Owise is an organization yeah. that we uh, pam you you know that you're yeah, people yeah. Are and um, that are great at helping you to record on your phone in your own app space what your symptom trackers are which is Again, something you don't then have to have a constant live diary page open, which was reinforcing the difficult stuff. You might just report it on OIs. Um, there's more willingness in the hospital for OIs to link with track um, or certainly with the chemo um, team in Ward 1 to make sure there's sort of live reporting of, of symptom. Um, but it's, it doesn't happen well in clinic yet, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. What's OIs? What is it? Well, why is it? it's, um, it's a, a private organization that have set up an app for recording all of your either breast cancer or prostate cancer details. So they've got two apps, one specific to breast cancer, one specific to prostate cancer, with really super detailed questions about um, yeah. date of diagnosis, the, the size of your cancer, the stage of your cancer, the grade of your cancer, the distribution of your disease, ER sensitivity, PR sensitivity, etc. And so it's a, just a great way of recording all of that very complicated medical language. But also they've got capacity to record symptoms, side effects, mood, well-being, um, yeah. treatment, all that sort of stuff. They actually I've got have... it. I have actually got it on my phone. Well <laughs> well <done. laughs> well well no, Nicola. Yeah, I was going to Start say typing. you do some really good sort of like their advice is also very, I find, easy to understand in terms That's of right. talking you through your symptoms. But they're also doing a tea and chat with us later on and oh, great. The year where they're going to go through the app. And show oh, us that's the good. of it. Um, and we've also done some blog content with them. So they're actually a really useful organization in terms of you know just trying to deal with your mm. your daily life with secondary breast cancer, if you like, you know, being able yeah. to sort of navigate. So I would I would truly recommend it. I do use the app just at this moment right. in time. I think there's sometimes there's different levels of how much you would use it depending on how you're feeling and what's going on, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it is a really useful tool. Yeah. 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 So does anyone else have anything they'd like to, to ask Andy about side effects or anything? Putting you all on the spot now. <laughs> I've always got something to say. Uh, so I, I can I keep it going all day. Excellent. But um, I get, I'm on um, ribociclib mm -hmm. um, and the hormone letrozole and yeah. solidex injections. Mm -hmm. So I've got early menopause mm -hmm. and that creates problems. But I think it I think it's the ribociclib that my eyes go, my eyes are really dark mm. and my mouth is really, it gets really sore. It hasn't been that sore this month, but yeah. I've had like cold sores, uh, lip, tongue, all mm. really sore. And do you think that's all related to well it must be? I never used to get it. So yeah. So um answer in two parts i'd be keen to you mentioned you have menopausal symptoms i'd be keen to know what they are because there's a, a very wide range of complicated menopausal symptomatology as a young woman that'd be worth talking about because it's a very common phenomenon um the ribociclib i think would be the thing that was is responsible for your mouth changes um and and that's difficult quite often that tender mouth or irritated gut is is a common side effect of it more so than your uh, anti-hormone treatment um the, the the smart thing to do is to use just a simple sort of bic or saline mouthwash on a regular basis you can use the commercial um, mouthwashes sometimes if your mouth is tender corsodil is painful um yeah and also corsodil is not great for your teeth long term either no. or there's some other mouthwashes that are maybe a bit better you can get mouthwashes that have got a local anesthetic in them things like diflam 
Um, I don't, I really yeah, I don't do. like Diflam. I have got Gel Claire. Okay, yeah, gel. I, I will do a, like, a, my mouth's really bad now. I'm going to have to mm-hmm. use a Gel Claire. Mm-hmm. But you mm-hmm. think the bicarb is probably best just it, day-to-day? To be honest with you, it is. It's the best way of managing yeah. the underlying bacterial content, the normal bacterial content in our mouth. Then if you manage that, then there's less risk of localised infection, whether it's a fungal infection or something else. Um, uh, and then the other most important thing is to stay hydrated, which might also be what you're noticing in kind of the changing colour in your eye whites. Um, dehydration associated with treatment is a very common phenomenon uh, and we're very poor normally as a as a nation we're really poor Pam's doing a good job of taking a glass of water as I say that um, <laughs> we're really poor at um, getting to two two and a half maybe three liters of fluid and on treatment you, you you certainly need to be up at the top of that to make sure your body's able to be ma- managing as much as possible so when your mouth's tender you'll produce more saliva You'll ingest it, you'll, you'll manage to recycle some of that, but you, it's easy to become dehydrated. Your mouth breathes more if you've got a tender mouth and you'll lose more hydration overnight. So really good idea, certainly in the morning, to make sure you're, you rehydrate yourself really well. Well, that's true because I wake up and some days mm. I can hardly open my mouth. It's yep. so dry. Super dry. And, so yeah. I was like, and then I was like, is dry mouth a thing? Mm. And it is a thing, isn't it? So I've got it's, a little spray. Yeah. To yeah. just do it, but yeah, I never thought about just basically hydrating mm. to keep my whole body hydrated, yeah. isn't it? Exactly. If, yeah, that's right. So, it, it, if you're locally hy- dehydrated in your mouth, yeah. it's a good measure of actually being quite dehydrated um, systemically. And um, uh-huh. checking the color of your pee is a sensible thing to do, also, just to make sure you're not too dehydrated. And the darker you are, the more dehydrated you are. So, try and make sure that you're always in a stroy clear. Uh, it's a good measure of your general hydration level and it is the best way of managing your mouth the gel clear or some of the other local kind of bungella type things are really good and um, local detenderizing things yeah. for your mouth also yeah yeah i have got that as like a backup i okay. try not to have it really though but i think yeah. tackling the dry mouth yeah will probably help me all together anyway won't it yeah so i've got yes. dry mouth mouthwash uh-huh. from boots that i started mm-hmm. using and my mouth is better this month Okay. I think you're keeping it hydrated, but yeah, the, I'll okay. drink more water. Yeah, thank you. But I just think feel like my whole body has dried out. <laughs> it will, and that so that point and um, does take you back to your your kind of <laughs> menopausal symptomatology. So localized dry mouth would be less likely to be a menopausal symptom, but the whole of your body. So in terms of skin dryness and vaginal yeah. dryness and eye dryness often is associated with um, menopausal symptom, um, particularly if your, your menopause is an untimely menopause or if it's a young age menopause because of Zolidix. Um, and that's difficult because sadly in a breast cancer um, circumstance, the options for managing menopausal symptomatology are, are minimal. Um, you know, standardly, you would go to the women's health clinic or and talk about HRT. Um, it is appropriate in terms of vaginal dryness to be able to use topical and localized uh, estrogen gels or creams um, and there is more evidence about the safety of that even if you are you are positive particularly right. in terms of just just vaginal comfort but also yeah. intimacy as well it's very important and there's it's appropriate to speak to your oncologist about that and possible referral then to in edinburgh anyway the women's health clinic which is a menopause clinic and in every i'm not sure where everybody else we is. do have one we do have okay. one in our area yeah. yeah in east Yorkshire, we're lucky i think we've got a whole area that hasn't got one but we yeah. do have one so and a- my nurse had said about referring me for something else not for that but mm-hmm. I'd, I'd asked ages ago years ago about it when mm-hmm. i was on smoxifen yeah. and the oncologist i had at the time said no Whereas that was yeah. probably about eight years ago. Exactly. That, that has some, that's been something that's been shifted in the in Edinburgh. Certainly there's more willingness to think about topical gels, particularly because they have such a low estrogen content. And sometimes they're not even estrogen content. It might be that they just use a good hydrating um, uh, gel of some form. Um, we do some work with uh, a sex therapist called Isabel White, who's a brilliant resource. Um, and her advice around intimacy and vaginal dryness is to use uh, a gel called yes 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 which is in terms of lubrication the most effective most natural um doesn't leave any kind of difficult residue uh, and is an appropriate thing to be able to use um but that that general dryness associated with uh, menopausal shift in terms of dry skin is is very common unfortunately sometimes also the content um, or the texture of your hair yeah. and the quality of your hair as well have you noticed your hair a bit thinner in your scalp yeah, my hair's bit? thinned out i mean the front of it really mm-hmm. came out after a, a few yeah. about two or three cycles on my bicyclip and i thought my right. hair was all going to come out mm. it hasn't it's just okay. 
thinned and the quality is not as good as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, I've really noticed it on Zolodex mm-hmm. and Letrozole. Yeah. 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 I've noticed it on Letrozole a lot that my hair is constantly falling out. Yeah. Right. Just constantly falling out. And it's it's not that I ever lose all my hair, mm-hmm. but they're just never it never seems to be what it was pre letrozole. Yeah. And yeah. I often wondered if that was a letrozole side effect. It, it definitely. So uh, hair thinning is more associated with tamoxifen um, than with the uh, aromatase inhibitors, but definitely with the aromatase inhibitors for some people, and particularly Perfect. a younger population who've had um, a more accelerated menopausal shift, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, what um, you you have a, a brilliant head of hair, a purple head of hair. Um, <laughs> so you definitely have hair, but what you're describing rightly is that you, you're yeah. really noticing the hair thinning. Yeah. I might not notice it because you, you've got about a bunch of hair. <laughs> I've learned how to disguise it. I think that's what it is. (laughs) One of the um, things that is increasingly suggested um, is the use of minoxidil as a hair thickener or hair strengthener. Um, Minoxidil, um, if you speak to any trichologist who are kind of hair specialists, they would recommend some kind of minoxidil based um, shampoo and you can get it as, as oils. They would recommend it more topically than orally. I think there are oral preparations you can get. I would be less keen on that um, for any of you, but okay. topical um, solutions may be more uh, helpful at just promoting good, robust hair growth for the hair regrowth that you are getting, even if you are having some hair thinning. Okay, that's really good a- advice. Thank you. AMA Hair Studios in Edinburgh have a trichologist um, that, that's yeah. one of the wig fitting services, but wherever your wig fitting service is in your local area, so um, like what you said, you're in Yorkshire, if, wherever it was, if you've been referred for a wig fitting service or if you just ask the rescue nurses, um, they should tell you where that is and they could give you some some good advice. Oh, right. Yeah, I never really thought about it. I was just mm. putting up with it. But actually, when I did mention my hair coming out, she said, oh, so we could do a referral. And I thought it was to somebody like that. And she went, for a wig fitting? I was like, it's not falling out that much. I don't think I need a wig yet. So that's yeah. that, when you mm. said about don't, you don't talk about your side effects as much, right. that absolutely made me think, don't talk about that anymore. Yeah, She's going to send me down to the wig fitters mm. and I don't mm. want to go down there. Yeah, that's right. So again, if you could be specific and say, listen, I'm experiencing hair thinning, not yes. hair loss, so I don't need a wig, but I would like you to refer me to the, the hair specialist to give, okay. can give me some guidance on. Um, that would be appropriate to ask that question. Do you Thank think you. patients do that a lot, Andy? Do you think patients will just sort of put up with a lot of side effects? Absolutely. Um, also partly because maybe they don't know what's causing it or which part of their medication is causing it? Yeah, I think there's two elements to that. I think um, in, in, in any situation in terms of cancer care, people expect side effects. So, and they, they feel, you know, if I'm going to be on chemo or a hormone treatment or I'm having surgery, I, well, of course there's going to be side effects. Therefore, I just have to deal with it. Yeah. To some extent that is true because there isn't always a solution for side effects, but the risk of that philosophy is, well, I just don't report anything because of course I'm going to have side effects. Of course I'm going to feel sick on chemo. Of course I'm going to experience X, Y, and Z. Um, and to your point earlier on, Pam, the medics and the nurses can't give you a solution if you don't tell them the challenge. But just as you described, Nicola, the, the risk is if you tell them, then either the, the symptom is misinterpreted or your message is misinterpreted. So the message of, actually, I don't like hair thinning, please give me some guidances, or I'm, you don't like being on letrozole, therefore you're going to have to stop letrozole, and well, I'm not really sure where we're going to go now. Mm. which is not what you were saying or not what you were suggesting at all, but is the risk of the misinterpretation, which again, if you can just hold that really clear factual, these are the key things that I'm struggling with at the moment and what guidance would you give me to be able to manage those? And you know, in, in often, um, sadly, in clinical environments, there is time limit and there is pressure focus to look at giving you your scan results, making sure your bloods are in good shape, making sure the life you know, the immediate life-threatening issues are addressed and then that's your 12 minutes up. So really you haven't got time to talk about sore joints or fatigue or, um, you know, other, interestingly, I'm just going to say relationship issues. You know, for me, that would be a symptom and or a side effect of treatment. It's classified as a psychological issue, but all of the psychological issues that any of you will have wrestled with, for me, are essential components of dealing with a diagnosis and dealing with treatment. And there's even less space for that within a clinic consultation, sadly, because they're, they're very medically focused, which is understandable. But it's even more important to use you know, forums like this or, or coming to a Maggie Centre or going to speak to your breast care nurse or speaking to Macmillan nurses about those types of issues. You know, these are the things that I'm experiencing 
and this is why it's having an impact. So I was talking about um, menopausal symptoms and vaginal dryness, which has an impact on intimacy and impact on libido. And very rarely, sadly, in my experience of working in the hospital, is that discussed. It's not. It's it's not a very British thing to talk about. <laughs> um, it's a bit rude. It's a bit. You know, <laughs> It's very personal and obviously it's very intimate and it's entirely your choice whether you bring that sort of subject up. But it does, it needs to be given legitimacy to talk about because it's often a very key part of people's lives and, and how that affects. So when I'm thinking about a list of symptoms, it's not purely nausea, hair loss, skin changes. Mm -hmm. It's also then moving into the less tangible things like fatigue, which is very difficult to, to measure. And then also importantly into really relational elements or psychological elements, mood state changes are very common side effects of treatment. And again, very rarely spoken about. Yeah. Yeah. So, does anyone else have a question or? Can I ask something? Of course. Um, yeah. I've been suffering probably for about a year now with repeated UTIs, all mm. E. coli food. Mm. When I'm on the antibiotics, they clear it as soon as I come off it comes back now having done my own research I've discovered that lack of estrogen thins my bladder yeah. and the best treatment for me would have been to have estrogen but obviously that's not an option yeah. I'm seeing a urologist in September but I'm just fed up of being on antibiotics I'm on a four-month course at the moment mm -hmm. and I'm I don't want the side effects from having long-term antibiotics. Is there anything else I can do? Quite right, Maura. Um, that, that's such an is important issue. I'm, I'm glad you've been referred to a urologist because there might be some kind of anatomical thing that they need to be able to look at and address for you. But what you describe is right. Um, gut flora um, and uh, skin flora changes post-estrogen change. And also there's some... Um, uh, in skin integrity changes that can happen that then do mean that people are more prone to UTIs. One of the things that you can functionally do um, is look at a probiotic content. So because you've now been on a lot of antibiotic and you're still on antibiotic, what that will do is in itself really change your normal gut flora, um, which is the, the bacterial content in your gut, and also your skin flora. At the moment, that's the right thing to do because you don't want to have a UTI. Uh, so you need antibiotics to deal with that. But the consequence of that is that you don't have a well-balanced skin flora or gut flora to deal with normal bacteria. It's, it, you know, we've all got healthy bacteria in our skin um, and healthy bacteria in our gut. The, also importantly, the gut bacteria are increasingly shown to be really infective and influential on our global immunological systems. So at the end of any, even a short course of antibiotics, our gut flora is not as good, therefore our immune system is not as good. And it's always a good idea to top up with some kind of probiotic content after antibiotics. So um, OptiBac, I think is the, the yeah, OptiBac is the product that I would recommend from having done research about the most effective, most potent level of um, bacterial content. It's a capsule that you would take on a daily basis and you're looking for something with a, um, 3 billion um, probiotics within it. So you can get Actimel and Yakult, the types of things you would buy in Tesco or Sainsbury's, um, but they have a much lower content level and it would be worthwhile getting the post-antibiotic OptiVac. There's a particular brand called post-antibiotic OptiVac. Can I buy you. that over the counter? You or can, can you yeah. yeah. No, you can buy that over the counter and you can get that from... <clears throat> Any of your um, local chemists or your health food store or somewhere like that will have that. Um, oh. And those, hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> and uh, they certainly any good pharmacist would be able to recommend that. And they would be able to recommend when's the best time to start it in relation to your antibiotic scheduling. But that can in itself help to minimize your risk of further UTIs by rebalancing your own healthy bacterial content. Okay. You're not getting his own prescription, Andy. You know, I don't know whether you can, Pam. Um, I don't think they're prescribed, but I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, I can check that, but I'm really not sure. I think they are classified as kind of health supplements, supplement, health supplements rather than prescribables. I'm not sure, though. Uh, I know that some people who've had um, chronic inflammatory disorders get them prescribed, but I'm not sure in this situation. It's worth asking your GP, though, Morag. Okay, thank you. Mm. Lovely to see an extra else? person in the group. Hello, oh, hello. Uh, hello. An extra, hello. extra attendee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
gonna say Three I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, does anyone else have any? Yeah, I, yeah. I had a I question yeah. actually about sleep. Mm -hmm. um, since I've started the treatment, um, I sleep really badly. Like my sleep mm -hmm. is really, I uh, quite light. I wake mm -hmm. up quite a lot at night, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's right. <laughs> what, 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 what's the treatment that you're on, Fee? Um, so I, I'm on. Uh, I was. I've changed treatment. Mm -hmm. I was on letrozole and uh, palbocyclib, and now I'm on everolimus. Everolimus, yeah. And um, Fasolidex. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the sleep. Yeah, the sleep. It's. Um, but I wake up very easily at night. Mm -hmm. It's like I can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't sleep deeply. Um, I don't really know what to do. I did try um, sleeping pills, but I don't mm. feel so rested the next day. Do you know what I it was you were prescribed for? Do you remember the name of the drug they prescribed? Um, Zopiclone? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And it's all right for like a day or two, but then when I take it for a few days, mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm not really rested. Mm. That's possible. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think that's right. Zopiclone is a really, really good drug and it's a very sensible prescription to have had. It's the sort of thing that's worth using intermittently. So oh, okay. if you maybe, depending on kind of family structure and kind of obligations during the week, if you know you need to rest before a Tuesday, take it one on a Monday night and take mm -hmm. one maybe on a Thursday before a Friday, it's not the best thing to be able to use uh, every day because some people do experience a bit, a bit of a hangover feeling or um, mm. just not deeply rested mm. I, I think th there's a range of things that could be happening for you understandably so um, somewhere the, the drug effect in itself will change a bit of normal biorhythm and um, mm. being in a situation of dealing with a diagnosis changes all sorts of elements to do with sleep you know constant rumination underlying stress underlying concern lead up to scans you know all of that will influence mm. normal sleep pattern unfortunately mm. there are some we run a really great, if I say so myself, sleep workshop, um, which if um, if any of you are interested, and we've got one coming up in the end of July with my colleague Lisa, who's going to be taking mm -hmm. that, um, which over two or three sessions looks at some of the good theory underneath sleep. Um, first of all, trying to take the stress out of not sleeping. Um, That's the big thing, because it's like a vicious cycle. That's I'm exactly getting... right. Yeah. It's horrible. It's, it's one of the most complicated things of light sleep is feeling like you've not rested enough and then being concerned mm. about the impact of not resting mm. enough mm. and et cetera, et cetera. If you can try and aim for four sleep cycles a night, you'll mm. have done a really good job of restoring your body and restoring your brain, even though your brain might not think it because you've been awake some of the night. Mm. And a sleep cycle is normally you can do a sleep cycle in about 45, 50 minutes. So if you've, if you've slept from say 11 till two, yes. you'll have done a couple of really good sleep cycles at least. And then you might wake up and you might be awake for an hour and mm. then you might go back and you might have another couple of sleep cycles over another couple of hours. You'll have mm. done enough work to restore mm. your body, okay. which is an important thing to say because within dealing with a health issue, the concern mm. is, gosh, I'm not getting enough sleep. Therefore, my body's not restoring enough. Therefore, mm. things are going to be worse because. Yes. So if you know that you've had some periods of rest, overnight mm -hmm. then that will make a difference and the time that you're awake if you can listen to a podcast if you can read a book if you can use some mm -hmm. meditation or mindful mindfulness techniques rather than oh my god i'm awake oh my god i'm awake oh my god i'm not going back to sleep mm -hmm. the horribleness of that experience mm -hmm. um but also within the session we, we talk about you know simple sleep induction almost like hyp hypnotic induction for sleep and the types of techniques mm -hmm. that you can learn to get you to sleep but mm. really importantly to get you back to sleep that difficult 2 a.m 3 a.m awakening mm. and then you struggle to get back to sleep and then you're just starting to fall asleep at six and your daughter gets up Thanks at, to at <laughs> um, can you is... access that course virtually andy or yeah, is it... so at, at the moment it is virtual yeah um yeah. Oh, God, great. i just wondered what yeah. the situation yeah, definitely. That would be mm. certainly something that anybody from anywhere would be happy to, mm. to join. Uh, would be really welcome to join. So, um, Claire, if you just anybody that's interested, say to yeah. Claire and or just contact me directly if, if my email is on any of the listings here. Uh, yeah. We will also we'll do a, probably in the next few weeks, we'll do a little promo on um, Facebook and Insta uh, for Maggie's Edinburgh. So if you follow okay. us on that, then you'll yeah. be able to hook into us. 
but it, it's it's a tough one for you and it, it's tough because sometimes along with chemo steroids are the thing that wire you up and mean mm. you can't sleep sometimes the hormonal shift that you're experiencing is the thing that mm. changes it sometimes mm. also just we are now in apparently looking outside we're apparently in midsummer um yeah. so it might not be sunny but the light quality will shift and if you now have a propensity for light sleeping you'll be much more affected by the environment around you so it's a, not a bad idea also to think about wearing an eye shade at night and it's maybe not the most attractive or romantic thing mm. to put on before you go to bed but mm. it, it'll functionally help you sleep better because you'll get less pineal, pineal gland stimulation at 4am uh, uh, when there's sunrise an eye shade is that the thing to yeah that's right just a you know one of the stretchy cloth eye shades you oh, can okay. buy them out right. of boots or buy them online uh, Okay. It's just a really good way of reducing stimulation. The other thing that's not a bad idea is um, silicon ear plugs. Again, not, <laughs> the, not the most romantic um, uh, accoutrement, <laughs> but um, really, really good at reducing noise stimulation. Mm. For you having a little one, you might want to mm. be able to listen out, but um, depending on whether you have a partner, um, somebody mm. else can be listening out, and you guarantee mm. that you get at least three nights where your ear plugs are in, you don't hear stimulation mm. and you don't um, have visual stimulation from light stimulus so, because it is about 4 4 15 that like the, the sunrise is starting to happen at the moment mm, okay um silicone earplugs that's a good idea because i've i've got some they're wax ones but they're um i'll try silicone i haven't thought of silicone the silicone ones are much better at um mm. at being a sound buffer and much better at staying in your ears as well okay great thank you mm. i did hear um i did read someone who they would actually like sunglasses in the evening mm, yeah do you like, think yeah. that's be... you know i i wouldn't say that's necessary um it, mm. i think it is it's appropriate for us to think about where we get our light stimulation from and, mm. and a lot of us are bad at being on our laptop at 11 o'clock and trying to go to sleep at 10 past um or being on our phones like and, and sometimes like it's just it's a routine that a lot of us have got into it's mm. worth trying to take that sort of light stimulation away um but there is enough of a patterning depending on what time you go try and go to sleep that you know mm. sundown just making sure you don't have bright lights in the, the room that you're in soft lighting in the background candle lighting you know some scents that are useful you know lavenders classically in a sleep induction um technique and then mm. some of the simple over-the-counter things are, are good you can buy things like um sleep easy or mm. um, calms k-a-l-m-s mm. all of which are uh, herbal preparations mm. which have been healthily shown not to have interaction with any mm. of the anti-hormone or chemotherapy drugs that you might be on mm. those are worth just adding in and then they give you a different effect to zopiclone zopiclone is good at knocking you a bit sparkle so you're out yeah uh, what you're describing for you is that you might feel a bit groggy in the morning yes yes okay thank you that's not very helpful and definitely let us know if you're interested in the sleep workshop. Lisa. Yes, I am. Yeah, definitely. yeah yes. by all means, if um, I'll actually email Great. everyone who's on the call after and I'll, I'll get the details. Mm. And send mm. that one, not a problem. Yeah. So, um, so just wonder, does anyone else have any side effects, queries that they sort of came into the call with? Yeah. Nicola, okay. hello. <laughs> oh, sorry. I've, had, I've just told my friend, she's, she's had primary breast cancer. She's on letrozole. She's had so um, this is relayed through her, mm -hmm. which she feels like she can't ask anybody mm -hmm. because she feels very embarrassed. And it's what you were saying. It's it's all a bit much. But she's yeah. been um, possibly in a new relationship. Mm -hmm. I've passed on the advice about the vaginal dryness. Yeah, yeah. awful. And I was saying mm -hmm. for her to um, she's in Scotland, mm -hmm. um, so she might be getting in touch with you. But then mm -hmm. her other one is um, flatulence. She gets mm -hmm. terrible flatulence, and she thinks mm -hmm. it's possibly is it related. Um, would it be? I tell you what, it might be related to just the fact that gut flora has altered um, because of treatment effect. Um, um, she had a, she had a oophorectomy, um, possibly. I think last year. Yep. That it, it shouldn't have a direct effect, but <laughs> I am trying to think whether or not it, it may well be that she just has a, a, appropriately in terms of the um, estrogen dip may well have changed the nature of how she manages her gut flora. Oh, um, yeah, would be my would be my first thought on that. And again, that would be appropriate. The same sort of advice I was giving to Morag earlier on about thinking about using a gut biome populator. Um, so not necessarily the post antibiotic one, but the general probiotics would be okay. an appropriate thing for her to consider and see. Just do that for two weeks and see if that makes a difference. Also appropriate for her to think about what she's eating. So for a lot of people I speak to um, who are dealing with a diagnosis, they make 
appropriate changes to their diet to maximize health and well-being but that can in itself cause major problems with flatulence so <laughs> if you increase the, the bean and, the wrong and thing. <laughs> population and if you have lots of cruciferous vegetables in your gut yeah. it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge um <laughs> there's a um, on that point if you if you want to persist with having legumes chickpeas beans etc which are a very good um resource for nutritional health and well-being there's a really good product called Bino, which is a flatulence reducer. I'm not absolutely sure how it works, but it's something you take. If you take it with meals that include things that you know cause you flatulence. So if you're eating cabbage soup all day and you take Bino with it, I'd encourage you not to eat cabbage soup all day. Um, but if you have like a lentil curry or something, you can take a couple of capsules with the lentil curry and it will reduce your flatulence. Bino is its name. And so is it B-E-A-N-O? That's it. Oh, right. I'll tell yeah. that. Oh, thank you. Honestly, and that's only you can buy, uh, buy online. And, uh, I'm other. laughing at Nicola asking for a friend. That was a low blow, Pam. Yeah. No I can said. send you the text. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've had a question in the chat box. Yeah, like, and Jenny. I see that, yeah. In the question there, do you need me to read it out or? No, I've got it here. I can, I'll read it out for you. Hi, I now suffer with, so Jenny, I appreciate Jenny's also said that she's not speaking out because she's in the clinic at the moment, so doesn't want to mm -hmm. say it out loud. Um, now suffer with hemorrhoids related to various treatments. Um, okay on Kate, but concerned about starting um, arubilin, um as it's a bit flaring up, occasionally bleeding, but mostly just pain. Any top tips? I've used suppositories which help, but it'd be nice if it didn't start. So um, Jenny, I'm really sorry. That is a horrible and painful and uncomfortable um, symptom. It is something that a lot of people uh, experience and very rarely talk about because it's a bit embarrassing and a bit uncomfortable. You're absolutely right to try and want to stop it from happening in the first place. And one of the most effective ways of managing it is just to make sure that you are slightly looser than you normally would be in terms of moving your bowels. So it's sensible to use either your, your diet as something that you know that will increase the um, motility of your gut or a gentle stool softener. Um, hemorrhoids tend to be exacerbated when we get a little bit constipated. So sometimes on chemo where we're given anti-sickness medication that makes you a bit constipated or like we were talking about earlier on about becoming globally dehydrated, you can then find that your stool is a bit harder and therefore you need to put a bit more pressure through to move your bowel. And that's mainly the key thing that exacerbates hemorrhoids. So if you can reduce the need to push when you're moving your bowel, that will help. So simple, so changes to your diet or a simple stool softener will help with that. I don't think the drug um, arubilin itself will cause a problem, but it may be the dehydration associated with it. So keep yourself hydrated, maybe a simple, a simple stool softener or just having some good, you know, prunes and pigs and uh, the, you know, granny's top tips to, to keep you regular is the best way of being able to do that. But it is uncomfortable. And certainly, as you say, if you found local um, suppositories uh, effective, those are really good to be able to use. Preparation H have a range of kind of products that are really good that you can purchase yourself or you can get prescribed by your GP to reduce those. Not pleasant. I hope that answers your question, Jenny. To, um, message us back if there was a supplement yeah. to that. Um, and good luck at clinic if you're sitting in the clinic waiting. Yeah, well, good luck. <laughs> um, anyone else have any queries or... Oh, got a wee message popped in. Let's have a look. Thanks. <laughs> so, oh, like, she's happy with that response. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so this is maybe a bit of a, a broad question, but... Is there a cancer side effect you're asked about often in Maggie's? Something that um, comes up a lot. Yeah, so for people who are just about to embark on treatment, most people ask about nausea and hair loss. So those are the key things that they're concerned about because it's what um, culturally we think is most associated with um, treatment. And they're very important um, symptoms to be able to, to think about, but nausea should be, absolutely should be um, properly managed by good antiemetic medication these days. Hair loss is challenging because sometimes there is no choice in that process as much as um, most chemotherapy units use scalp cooling um, machines. Sometimes some oncologists aren't comfortable with that and that can be completed. Plus also it's not a pleasant experience in terms of sitting with your head in a, a bucket of ice for an hour or so. Um, the thing that probably comes up as one of the most impactful side effects uh, is fatigue. 
Uh, and again, mm. fatigue very rarely properly looked at clinically in, uh, in the clinical environment. Again, partly there's an expectation that, yep, on treatment, you'll be a bit knackered. Being on treatment that's, that's short term in terms of curative, curative intent, radical treatment is one thing, but dealing with metastatic disease with treatment that continuously and constantly affects your stamina levels is really, really difficult. Yeah. And there is, um, there is more research that needs to be done about it, but there's also more willingness to look at your thyroid levels, to look at your general biophysiology, to make sure your magnesium levels are okay, to make sure your hemoglobin is okay and that you don't need a blood transfusion. Again, the oncology unit's tolerance of you having a hemoglobin of eight or nine, mm -hmm. from, my, from my opinion, is far too high. They're, they're very likely to allow you to kick around with a low hemoglobin and not want to transfuse you when sometimes it is necessary. So that's probably, in terms of impact, one of the most powerful impacts in terms of side effects that, that isn't well managed, to be honest with you. And what about kind of the work-life balance kind of thing and um, like for me personally I'm I'm still working but four yes. days a week I did drop a day mm. um, in my previous job before I started with make seconds count but I'm still doing yeah. four days now mm -hmm. but is the work-life balance I sometimes struggle with it and sometimes mm -hmm. don't get it right um, mm -hmm. and then the symptoms of like fatigue but it's actually just yeah. feeling overtired exactly um, and then lack of and, sleep and things like that yeah. you know so is there is there tips or Mm -hmm. technique that people should be using if they're still trying to maintain their work as well as their treatment yeah i think it, uh, one of the first things that, that comes to my gut when you you mention it is uh, first of all try and drop guilt so one yes. of the challenges of what you've just yes. named um is is yes the impact on you so yeah of course i'm absolutely exhausted i've knocked my pen at work now i've got to make the tea now i've got to look after the kids now i've got to look after my mum or make those phone calls to my friends and I feel like a rubbish mum or a rubbish friend or a rubbish partner. Um, that's it, it, that's an unnecessary pressure to place on self. And if you can drop the guilt associated with that, because actually, if you recognise what you're achieving, you'll be much more proud of yourself than the things that you feel yeah. you're dropping. But absolutely, as you describe, um, somewhere it's essential for your employer to really understand that you are on constant treatment of mm -hmm. some sort, wherever that might be, or on constant review that brings its own anxiety and concern yeah. that has an impact on your stamina and your mood. So that um, it's a hard thing to say to a line manager, particularly if you've not got a very sensitive line manager, um, but it is important to say that, you know, I just need to remind you that this is happening in my life and this is what's going on. I intend to be the best employee I can, but there may be times where I have to come in late because I've not slept. I may be times where I have to, um, you know, take a break or step outside to refresh. Mm -hmm. I guess also then thinking about how you pace the other part. So work sometimes isn't paceable, but but life can be a bit more paceable and um, less paceable with young children around, but more paceable with friends. So mm -hmm. try not to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mm -hmm. with social uh, commitments. If you can space that as much as that sounds really dull, it's appropriate to be able to give yourself the permission to, to space. Yeah. Um, because the, the life part has to happen, but it has to happen in a way that's enjoyable to you rather than, oh my gosh, I'm having to go out again. I really wanted to see John, but I'm just too knackered and I don't think I can do it. So I'm going to be letting him down. So, but I must go. And then you come home and you're knackered and nobody's really benefited from it. So um, work often is the thing that is inflexible. If you can give as much flexibility to it by being honest with them, that's good. And then you then do the the slightly dull work of managing your social commitments. Yeah, the rest of your calendar to be a bit more... Yeah. yeah, just being aware, I guess, of you know how tired you're feeling and things. Yeah, like not, not that's exactly it. Clear it is about being uh, aware of it, and I, you know, I've said it a couple of times. That it's dull. It's dull work to have to schedule your stamina, um, and yeah. but if you don't, you'll deplete yourself. You're, you're just going to struggle otherwise, aren't you? It's you and that it, won't benefit. That's right. Yeah, and I suppose similarly to the work thing, then the the finances can sometimes be a big thing for people yeah. because. If they're now struggling to work or they can't do the same hours they used to, their finances change. Exactly. How can Maggie's or um, yeah. a support service help people yeah. in terms of their finances? That, that is hugely important. So uh, for a number of people, they have to make adjustment to their work. So, uh, you know, I was five days a week, but I, I'm going to have to go to three days a week because mm -hmm. sustaining five is too much. But then yeah. you're having two third drop in your salary. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. Um, so uh, Anne, who's our benefits advisor in Edinburgh, but every Maggie Centre has a benefits advisor who can help you with application for personal independence payment, which fundamentally is essential in lots of your circumstances. Um, 
it's non-income dependent, so you can still be earning high level money and be in receipt of PIP because something has changed in your ability or your capacity. And that's yeah. often the, the bit that then might cover the gap in earnings. Yeah. Also employment support allowance and universal credit and the other um, very mm -hmm. complex um, uh, benefits that are around uh, are worth taking advice on. Yeah. It's also worth speaking to somebody like Anne or a, a colleague of hers about other grant making organizations that can be helpful. So with some professions, you can get a grant that might be a gap filler. And um, so if you've been in the forces before, there are a number of grant making organizations. If you've been a nurse before, if you've been in the services before, a policeman or a fireman, um, there are some grant making organizations that can give you a bit of a, uh, an assistance with that. And then there's some very obscure and, uh, and uh, I don't want to be disparaging by using the word random, but quite odd grant making organizations. Yeah. There's a brilliant organization <laughs> called um, the Women, the Indigent Women of Edinburgh Society, which doesn't sound like a, a, a grant you would wish to be uh, eligible for, but it's a phenomenally important grant that was set up in these are kind of Victorian language. It was set up for single women who are doing their thing and getting on great with life, and then something happens. So it was to support independent feisty you know able women to continue to be independent and feisty it's a brilliant grant making organization they <laughs> players volunteering for the, the feisty I love award that. i want to um, read that i am that person good um, um so it's so worth thinking about in terms of okay i might not be eligible for people might not be eligible for esa but don't stop asking the question about are there yeah. grant making organizations and there's um, a really great organization called turn to us mm -hmm. kind of like make seconds count it's turn number to us um, and it's a, a directory of um, grant making organisations that might be able to support people in a range of circumstances. Because yeah. I think the the stress that comes with a lot of that, I know before I was awarded PIP, I had a real struggle um, yes. and it really affected me mentally mm -hmm. um, so much so that I was really over worrying about so many things and made myself ill, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously those things are so important as well when you're dealing with your cancer and your medicine. Definitely. It's a else. huge extra practical pressure because if you yeah. start worrying about not being able to pay your rent and being evicted from your house, mm -hmm. that's that's an immediate pressure, more so than the fear of your disease yeah. process. And you're absolutely right, Claire. It's a really important subject. Yeah. Um, just wondered if anyone else had, I mean, I've obviously got a few more questions, but if anyone else has got anything they want to ask, Nicola, just, yeah, when you go, a, lovely. <laughs> another question for another Sorry, friend. I've got a full another list friend. of them. <laughs> Um, no, it's not for a friend. It's what you said, Pam, about being achy and joints. And I think that's letter us all for me, but I've just gradually, my knees are going and I feel yeah. achy when I get up and mm -hmm. it's just, is there anything we can take? I'm, I'm trying to do more yoga yeah. and I'm trying to stand more because I've realised I, I sit a lot on my chair, so I'm yeah. sloping. So that makes me achy when I can't walk, so I get mm -hmm. up. So I'm trying to stand, but Great. is there any supplements so we can take? What, what you're doing is absolutely right. So continue to be physically active and continue to try and make sure your muscle integrity is pretty good around the particular joints that hurt. So, so helping those muscles to support your joints a bit more. In terms of supplement, the, the key thing that I would recommend is curcumin curcumin with piperin so turmeric um can i take uh, that i don't think i can take it with ribociclib no that's a very good point i, I think it's to, a contra i need to check about that that may well be the case nicola with ribociclib i'd have to check to be honest with you or check with your pharmacist um at the yeah all department. right yeah did you spell Even, that for me andy yeah so um so it's turmeric but it's the the drug Stop. name is curcumin c-u-r-c-u-m-i-n curcumin and you want to take it curcumin with piperin, P-I-P-P-I-R-I-N. So essentially you, you could put a spoon of turmeric and then grind some black pepper in. So it's turmeric with pepper, oh. curcumin with piperin, which the piperin helps the absorbability or the effectiveness. If you have it with a bit of oil in some respect, so if you make a, a curry, you've got some curcumin and piperin in it, and that's just a great way to have it. If you want it just as a supplement, you can take it as a capsule but um, it's generally best taken with something that's got a bit of fat within it. So you might have some oat milk or some yogurt or something that's got a little bit of fat in it. It's a very effective natural uh, anti-inflammatory agent. Oh, right. um, but please, as you rightly mentioned, check about the um, ribocyclob. 
I would I would have to check to see whether there's an interaction issue. Well, I can. What I do, um, if I'm thinking of checking something, I write it down, show it yeah. to the pharmacist, yeah. come back, yeah. and then they've looked it up mm-hmm. when I come out. So Perfect. they. That's just... great that they've got that. You've got that resource available to you. Yeah. If, yeah. if that isn't um, helpful, it's appropriate to use unless you've got a, a severe asthma case. It's appropriate to use topical ibuprofen, so ibuleaf gel on the joints or the bits of your um, bones that hurt the most, um, that's a good idea. And if you put that on at night, oh. you can wrap a little bit of cling film around. So if it's your knees particularly, put a bit okay. of gel on your knee, put a bit of cling film around and it'll continue to make sure you absorb it rather than it going all over the bed clothes. Um, that can be useful. And again, useful to take it topically rather than as a an, an yet another oral preparation. Yeah, I've been using diclofenac and it has yeah. helped a bit. Diclofenac, is, anything else. Yeah. diclofenac mm-hmm. is probably the most effective non-steroidal anti-inflammatory plan and it is a really good drug. You do need to be careful of your gut with it to make sure your gut doesn't get too irritated. I'm taking it as a topical cream because I'm on blood thinners now, so... Yeah, I that's the right thing. Really. Yeah, that's the right thing to be able to do. Um, but it is tough. It's tough to manage the impact of that. And for some people, they use joint supports so you know just a little tubular grip around their knees or ankle supports if it's their ankles which mm-hmm. is is uncomfortable and it, you know it's not the best fashion statement but it might be the sort of thing you use at home to give a bit of ease or comfort with that some people spare by the um copper bands and you can get like tubular grips with copper in them and some yeah. people say they're very effective they're generally advertised at a sporting population so tennis elbow or yeah. golfer's mm-hmm. knee or something like that and um, some people do say that they help i haven't seen evidence for it but i've heard anecdotes for it so. i did find the strapping help nicola yeah. um, but i can't do i can't do it myself because my ankles mm-hmm. and nobody here can do it they've got no patience so only when the physiotherapist does it for me but mm-hmm. i've then seen another physio and they've said that's okay for pain control but not mm-hmm. as a like healing thing so they weren't so keen on doing it so kinesio tape is really, really important. So it's kind of a, the extension. It's more detailed um, tubi grip. Um, and mm-hmm. it is often very good isolated um, joint stuff. If you jump onto YouTube and so whichever bit of your body source, so knee pain, kinesio tape, uh, it's just K-I-N-O-E-I-S-I-O, kinesio tape. Um, there's a number of physios who've posted loads of um, how, how to strap yourself up and little videos and um, i've used that a lot with some of the running i've done and it's been really effective okay. just some very simple taping mm-hmm. with kinesio tape can make a big difference to your point pam i think you're right it doesn't necessarily help the healing process sadly with a lot of the joint related issues to do with hormone stuff it's n- you're not going to get a healing process it's the inflammatory element to do with okay. the drug itself or the lack of estrogen which is the issue you continue continue doing what you're doing in terms of trying to maintain activity and maintain muscle mass yeah. It's probably the best thing you can be able to do to manage that. Yeah. Would yeah. private physio, would physio, not private, would physio help? Physio would absolutely be appropriate because they would be able to understand what the muscle structure is around the joint that's sore and also help you to then think about how you stabilize the muscle joint with some, uh, stabilize the joint with muscle activity. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm aware we've got about three minutes left. As I say, this is probably a subject that we could all talk about endlessly. So I just wondered, is there any last minute queries anyone has or any last? Can I just point out, well, not quite, bring everyone's attention. When I was taking, started on my cake, uh, everything was wrong with me. I was just wasn't coping at all. And everyone else was managing it so well, I felt. And I spoke to Alison at Maggie's, Andy, and just all the help she gave me. And I think anybody starting on a new treatment, because I was, wasn't taking anti-sickness because I was scared of constipation, but she said the anti-sickness I was on was actually going to help my, my bowel and stuff like that. So that was even, I was better yeah. taking it, yeah. even though I thought it wasn't. And she just gave me advice to take like an anti-acid stuff, like Lansoptosol, I was taking, I was to take it all the time because I was not taking it on my week off. And it's just, just gave me so much advice on how to manage yeah. my side effects. So. I think it's worthwhile for anybody Definitely. to, to touch base I, I, I really appreciate that feedback, Pat, and I'll say that to Ali because you know she's a, a great resource. And I, <clears throat> your feedback's really important for all of you and anybody else that might watch this afterwards, it, which really gets back to the, the point that was made at the very start. Sometimes it's difficult in a clinical environment to raise these things for a range of reasons. No criticism of the doctors or nurses, but it just sometimes is difficult. But if you can find a venue like Maggie's or... 
your McMillan nurse or whoever, or imp really important to this group, mm -hmm. ask the questions because you'll be give, able to be given some guidance on how best to manage, either manage practically or important, manage psychologically. If you feel you can manage it psychologically, that's half of the battle. Also, having spoken to somebody who's got an expertise like myself or Ali, and um, hopefully gives you that extra practical support too. Absolutely. I actually phoned up because I thought it was in my head. I thought the no mm. because everyone else was doing so well, I thought I was just the nausea yeah. was in my head and all that. So that's why I phoned Maggie's. I didn't mm. think to phone them practically for yeah. actual advice. So mm. it was great that she gave me proper advice for all the side effects. That was Good. brilliant. Amazing. I think I think we can all agree that having something like a Maggie Centre that you can work with alongside your medical team because actually your medical team will do the medical bit, but actually Maggie's and that sort of support service will be there to sort of pick up all the other bits that are really surrounding your, Good. you know, your yeah. your ongoing care, if you like. Is that not, that would really be what I would take from it. <laughs> we Absolutely. don't have a Maggie, we don't have a Haven. The Haven in Leeds, that's our local one, is closing mm. down. Hey, there's a Maggie's, Maggie's in Leeds. There's, there's a Maggie's there's, in Leeds. Yeah. There is. It's, it's about... 60 miles for Ooh. me so i'd have to drive so, yeah. or get a train and the trains so i've Give got my phone though nicola so some of that some of the work in fact last year a lot of the work we did was online or or by phone so amanda who's my equivalent in leeds would be delighted to speak oh to really me. absolutely oh, okay um, you don't have to go into the center I, for your own sake it's a beautiful center to go into so oh, it looks you lovely to, if you happen to be in Leeds, <laughs> so jealous oh, but um, but I appreciate sixty miles is that's a big journey for maybe a, a half hour conversation. So please do phone Amanda. She is. Oh, brilliant. okay, I will do. Really yeah, thank you. Happy to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I I don't have a Maggie's near me either. Yeah. I think my nearest one would be in London. Uh huh. Where are you um, based, Mark? I'm I'm um, in Bracknell near Reading. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. Sadly, it would be within London. Nothing itself. there. Is there any plans for anything to come this way? Not, not that I'm aware of, unfortunately. Um, the certainly we do have plans for further centres, um, but they're all at major cancer centres at the moment. But what we've what we've experienced from this last year is just how flexible our service can be. Just as this session is happening, and you're all in different parts of the country, that's what we that's what I've been doing over the course of the last year. I've been supporting people across the UK and actually internationally. There's a lot of people from Europe and uh, further afield who've been joining us on some of our Zoom support or just phoning us uh, or emailing us. So more, please feel free to contact me, but also contact geographically your nearest centre, just that you feel a bit more connected to them and they would be delighted to be able to support you, even if you're not coming into the centre. Thank you. Yeah, and like I say, if anyone wants any information or wants uh, Andy's details, I'll be more than happy to right. pass them along. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you Thank you again so for much. joining us. Thank you. Thank you. What, thank what, thank you. I've got so many notes written down on my own mm -hmm. pad. So thank you so much. Lovely to see you thank all. You. And, um, lovely to meet your lovely to see your daughter you. as well, Faye. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> lovely to see you. Good luck. Normally asleep. <laughs> she looks lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, Andy. See everyone later. Thank you very much. Bye. Really good. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>